Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Wednesday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel, Joel L. Khan, and Dennis Dick. Man, what a start to the quarter we had yesterday. The We had the, the news yesterday regarding the, the brokerage wars, so uh, those were the big movers of the day. We had a weak PMI number. Uh, so we have, we're going to talk about those moves. We're going to talk about some earnings as well. Wild moves in Stitch Fix after the bell. UNFI is moving as well. Uh, Joel and Dennis both had a stock taken out this morning, TSG, but sometimes in trading, it's not about whether you're right or wrong, but about when you are right or wrong. Timing matters. We'll talk about that. And our guest today, a new guest, David Keller. He is a chief market strategist at StockCharts.com. He would join us here at 835. Joel, in the meantime, what's the word here? Overnight trading. Uh, in the red here by 12 and three quarters handles at 29.25, even pre-market high, 40, 29.49, little bit over last week's low, pre-market low, 16.75. Folks, I don't have anything there. I'm looking for 29.02.75. That was your September 4th low. That's about 22 handles away. Uh, crude in the green by 36 cents at 53.98. Gold in the green as well, 14.92. Silver back over 17 here, up 5.3 cents at 17,355. Bitcoin down $10. That's the futures at 83.15. So that's the move overnight. Bring in Triple D and uh, Triple D. I guess you delivered me some kind of good, kind of not so good news. <laughs> well, it's good this news. Morning when I us. got out of the pool. Yeah, well, it's good news for us. We did. Joel and I have had been along the Stars Group for a while. It did get taken over here overnight. Uh, bought by who bought it? Spencer, give us the headline. Flutter Entertainment, European company. Yeah, uh, they're they're Irish, I believe, and these are the owners of Fanduel. If you are into daily fantasy sports you know about FanDuel uh, these guys own them Flutter Entertainment they trade OTC the ticker in the US is PDYPY but their primary listing is in London and it was trading up in London and this is us all stock deal what's the ratio if the risk Arabs want to go overseas yeah, so uh, TSG shareholders are going to get uh, 0.2253 new Flutter shares for every share of TSG that they own um, so Flutter shareholders will own about 54% of the new merged company. TSG shareholders will get the remaining 45%. It's good news for me and Joel. This is a stock that we were too early on, though. So it's just a good lesson that even if you get the story right, you got to get the timing right, too. And Joel and I liked this stars group because it was a pure play on sports betting in the U.S. That is the reason they got acquired today. <laughs> But we were just too early, Joel. We bought this thing back when it was $24 or $25. It's coming back, and it's going to get us a lot of our losses here back. But it shows you your timing. If you're too early, you can be right about the story but still lose money on the trade. And I'm probably going to just ring the register here today because I don't know if I want to own the European yeah. company going forward here. Uh, but we'll see. It's obviously trading very actively here at this point. I already traded 857,000 shares. It's trading off of the price of the acquirer that is trading over in London right now. Uh, so that's why you're seeing quite the tight market here as well. But I think I probably just eat the remainder of the loss that I have here. I think I'm averaging. It's confusing for me because I bought on, in, on the Toronto Stock Exchange. I think I'm in for 32, but that would be equivalent to about 24 and a half, I believe. On, t on the U.S. exchange, so I'm still down about three points and looks like I'm going to eat it today. You know what? I, I guess it just wasn't meant for me to make money in the uh, sports gaming industry. Remember? You tried that a few different ways. Yeah, yeah. This was back in the early 2000s or maybe 2000. Uh, Rob and I created a sports betting platform so you could tr on trade sports. And so you had a it was like a stock platform for sports. And Sound you could like a good idea. It was a great idea. Why did it not work? Well, it did work. And we had maybe like a thousand customers. And then uh, good old George Bush came in and said, anything internet related gambling 
I did what, what did he get reelected the second time? It was like oh four or something like that. Yep. And uh, he said anything internet gambling related is like totally, you know, it's like we knew it was illegal, but you know, we had found some ways around it. And uh, when he came out with that, I talked to Rob about it and we said, Hey, we just got to shut down the company. And it was called T2T. So your regulatory oh. is what happened yeah. to you. You have yep. regulatory risk in all industries and you got dinged directly. We had wow. we had maybe five, six hundred subscribers paying, you know, for the uh the monthly fee for the platform. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And then I tried to unload it to um what's that one in uh England, Betfair. And uh, they, they had absolutely no interest in talking to us. But, man, yeah, every time I hear about that sports wagering, it's like it, it, it just it bugs me. But uh, anyways, whatever. I'll probably, I don't want to own this other company either. I'll probably just uh, ring the it's register. Le- it's leaking while we talk here. I know. Too, unfortunately. I know. So I'd li- I liked it better when it was 22 this morning. Now it's 21. Uh, anyways, yeah. obviously it's trading off of what the other companies doing over there in Europe, and we just look at the A- or the ADR or this trading over here, and it's not really trading. So yeah, it's yeah. It's just, so it is what on. it is. I mean, it just goes to show you again, timing is everything in the markets. So let's move on from that story and move on to the market story because we had a significant sell off yesterday. Uh, we've had tea leaves of this coming because we lost all the leaders and the laggards became the leaders and now the laggards are starting to lag as well so it was a little bit of a sell everything market yesterday a little bit of a sell everything market here this morning if i'm looking at my screen here i see a few gold stocks trading higher i do see the tlt trading higher uh but really on my screen out of like the major like dow components here the only one i'm really seeing in the green solidly is johnson and johnson and that's because they got an opioid settlement there overnight. What was the news on J and J? Yeah, actually, it's it's not just J and J. It's uh, a few a few places. So J and J is paying. Uh, so uh, yesterday it, it came out that so there was a settlement with Purdue, or that they they filed for bankruptcy, and it came out that the other healthcare providers, the other opioid providers, are trying to get in on this. Purdue bankruptcy and also pay up now so they don't have to pay up later. So th- today it came out that Johnson Johnson is paying $20.4 million to settle claims made by two counties in Ohio. Uh, Mallinckrodt is also settling with $24 million in the same two counties. Endo, International, and Allergan, they settled in August, and uh, that just leaves McKesson, Amerisaurus Bergen, Cardinal Health, Teva, Walgreens, and Henry Schein as the firms that uh, the remaining defendants as we head towards the the actual court case here later in the month. So Johnson Johnson selling for twenty point four million, and Mallinckrodt settling for twenty four million. Both uh, slap on the wrist is is too light a term for for what they're paying. In so my- that's why you're seeing the stock trade up here in the pre market, and uh, we're up a buck twenty three. I think in a in a good tape you would probably see it up more, but that's not the case. Obviously, it's an ugly tape, and also the tape tells a story too. Is that people are just nervous right now and they're looking to sell stuff. So I'm not coming in here and buying anything. Probably at least you know maybe I'm buying. The, if I had a stock on my list, maybe I'm looking at that, but I'm not buying a stock that's trading in the green here this morning because it's just the kind of tape that could make something go red, even though it doesn't deserve it. Uh, we just hit the uh, the pre market high at one thirty one thirty. Uh, what do we have for yesterday's high? Yesterday's high. It's above yesterday's high. I like this thirty one fifty area. The reason it's a pair of uh, highs from the twenty fifth and twenty sixth. So if you can clear one thirty one fifty, maybe you climb into the one thirty two handle. One thirty two seventy eight was your next daily high. Uh, just a little bit something just overall market related here and it was a really bad start to the quarter and i think that that's really significant we have a couple things in play here we had an expiration that really was a dud right which expirations are turning points and they couldn't jam this thing up to new all-time highs the first day of the quarter everyone was like get me out of the pool okay Really bad. I'm really looking for the market to recover over the next 20 days. And I'll give you my number. We're trading right there. It's 29.25 even. And I can't tell you why I like that number for the quarter. If I did, I'd have to kill you. But that's going to be the number. We hold 29.25. Yeah, I think we're going to go. I think we got a chance to go up and get that 3,000 handle. If not, if not, and I'll give it, I'll do the old two or three closest thing. 
I think we uh we test that quarterly low of twenty seven seventy seven. That's about one hundred and fifty points down here. So uh, it, bad day, really bad day to start the quarter, and uh, things aren't looking so good today either. Before just... we throw in the towel on today, though, what I will say is uh, imbalance has now come out at eight o'clock. So that's you know the adjustment they made about a month and a half ago from eight thirty to eight o'clock. Oh, okay. It's buy imbalances across the board right now, and we are seeing the S and P show a little bit of life since that eight sure. o'clock. We went up a couple of points. Now, obviously. These buy imbalances usually, you know, will pair off at a lower price. So it's very early. We're still an hour and a half before some, you know, big institutional sellers might come in. But just to give you some numbers here, Bank of America, 139,000 to buy. Um, looking at Procter Gamble, 50,000 to buy here this morning. Uh, Disney's got 30,000 to buy. General Electric, even with a buy imbalance of 77,000, which is rare for GE, which always has a sell imbalance. AT&T, 113,000 to buy. Verizon, 76,000 to buy. Pfizer, 128,000 to buy. I mean, they're across the board. They're buy imbalances. So does, you know, things change here in the next hour? Do we start going up? Because one of two things have to happen. The stocks, have, those imbalances have to turn to the sell side or mm-hmm. the S&Ps are going to start to come up. And we're starting to see the S&Ps rise a little bit here. So I wouldn't be selling anything in the hole, at least here at 812. Maybe at 930, the story is different. But right now, it doesn't look like as weak as the S&P futures are showing us, at least if we're looking at the stocks as an indicator. Yeah, and I'm, I'm no economist here. And I think someone mentioned in the chat yesterday, I mean, manufacturing. Okay, yeah. I mean, isn't our manufacturing production going down for decades? Aren't we a service economy going to McDonald's and Burger King and getting food? I mean, I saw, you know, manufacturing is important. Yeah, the strong dollar, you know, it's hurting it, but... I mean, to me, I, I mean, it's, it's bad news. We were sitting okay. The market was sitting way okay uh, before that news came out. And who knows? You know, you could get a, uh, you know, we got the jobs number on Friday, right? So Things who knows? Change. You get it. Yeah, everything. Can, I mean, especially in this market, you get a tweet, you get a deal with China. Oh, I mean, and we yeah. know Trump defends it too. Yeah. You know, there's another consideration as well. It starts going down a lot. Does Trump get Twitter happy here and trying to defend the market again? potentially so there's always that wild card if you were short that you get a trump tweet and says oh yeah we're real close with china and the dow opens up 300 points in your face so there's a lot of considerations it's still not that easy of a market to short even though it looks like you know there's a lot of things ready to roll over that haven't rolled over yet um and you know maybe i'd be nervous on some of those some stocks we've talked about have already significantly rolled over i mean if you're coming here and shorten roku now or coming here and shorten shopify now you're late to the party. It's four hundred dollars a month ago. Now it's three hundred dollars. Roku one hundred and seventy. Now it's a hundred. I mean, all it takes is a couple of, an, an analyst to come out and say, "Hey, we're looking okay here," and the story could get hot again because storied stocks go cold, but sometimes they turn around and start to show life again there. And Roku stopped going down. I mean, if I was looking at Roku as a potential trade, I'm not sure I am or not. You got a pretty good bottom at ninety eight bucks right now. I mean, you had the low ninety eight sixty five on September twenty fourth. You got the low 9808 on September 27th, and then you got the low from uh, just yesterday or two days ago at 9869. So call it 98 bucks, rounding for you know the big whole number. That's support. So if you're buying here this morning at 101, you give yourself three bucks. Maybe the market turns around. Yeah, but I mean, I just think you know overall, you know, you just got to look at the you know the fat also. You get another cut in interest. I mean, there's a there's a lot of lot of wild cards yes. out there. Yes, okay. completely agree here, Joe. A lot of wild cards, a lot of considerations here. But so. I, I just want to, I don't know if we've had this. I know me and you are on the same side of this TSG trade, uh, but I took the other side of a trade of you and Spencer's. What did you do? You shorted uh, Disney. I shorted Disney. I it doesn't it. look good. I knew it. <laughs> I'm glad. I wish I would have sold it all. I cannot believe I sold half of my position on that day. Because I just got nervous that it wasn't. It was a fib, you know, and I talked about this on the show a little while ago. It came up back to the 50% retracement around 140 and looked like, you know, it was struggling to get through there. It was just a classic technical trade. Um, and I said I would get back in. I have not got back in those shares yet. So I have a half size position now in Disney. Um, always my half sizes I lose on. When I, I feel know, like I should get out my spiny senses. Si- when my spiny senses are telling me to sell and I sell only half because I want to hold some, I should just sell it all. But anyways, my spiny senses were telling me that this was, you know, not working out the way I wanted it to work out. Um, and now, you know, it's obviously off significantly here. And I mean, it's not only, you know, something that I failed to realize, maybe, you know, when I was getting rah, rah, Disney, was that Netflix. I mean, you have Netflix, you have Apple, 
Comcast. So it's not only competition for Netflix, but it's going to be competition for Disney as well. Apple is uh, competition for Disney. Comcast is potentially uh, competition for Disney. This could be a very expensive little streaming war here going on. And, you know, that still benefits stocks like Roku, obviously, which is why I'm I'm yet to pronounce Roku dead, even though I think the valuation doesn't make any sense at all. I I think there could be a trade to the long side on Roku here yet. Uh, you know what? I uh, I heard some news on Netflix, and I, don't, I doubt if I'm gonna uh, be trading it at all. But uh, did you hear what the what movies coming out? Um, their own production, The Irishman. Have you heard about Spencer? Oh, yeah. oh I'm so. Is this the uh, one I, that they were advertising there yeah. today with Ryan Reynolds? No, no, no. The, no. This, uh, this is the Scorsese movie. Scorsese and De Niro oh. and Joe and Pacino. Pacino. Two oh, Pacino's of my coming out. And Joe yes. Pesci. And Joe Pesci. And Joe Pesci. Oh yeah, those are good guys. Those are good. I like those guys. Oh yeah. Oh oh, we're excited. We're excited. Those are two of my. I swear, I have like favorite actors. And oh yeah, De Niro good. and Pacino are two of my favorite acts. So I'm talking with my uh, my future uh, son-in-law, and we were talking about Netflix. And is that like, gonna be a movie or a series? A movie, movie. coming out uh, later this year, I think. They need to get yeah. these series going though, because the they're series... gonna make a series office. I bet. Off, I bet you they do. Or something. They're going to do something off this. So that's huge, man. De Niro. Who are the female actresses in there? Do you guys know? I can look it up quickly. But yeah. It's, it's, gonna be, uh, it, it's, it's coming out November 27th on Netflix. And um, what I actually, I was going to mention this a few weeks ago and I, and I kind of forgot. But, you know, we know we know they're not really going to tell us how many people watch it because they never do like what they'll do is they'll probably say, Oh, in the first 48 hours, X number of people, uh, you know, stream it or, or whatever, uh, or X number of accounts, right. Is, is what they'll say. But if they can't, if this movie stinks is what I was going to say, because Netflix has a rep for making bad movies. Uh, if this movie stinks, then that, that, that'll be an omen. Because oh this- man. Joe Pesci is Frank. It's going to be good with those guys. Jimmy right. Hoffa uh, is portrayed, I think by, uh, De when's De this come out? November 27th. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. But then they had Ryan Reynolds. They were uh, doing something with him yesterday, too, which was advertised. Somebody was saying that was why the stock was up. I'm not sure if that's the case or not, because Netflix actually closed in the green yesterday on a day when a lot of things were red. But anyway, I don't recognize so- the female actresses in here. So, yeah. so it, it's three and a half hours. So be warned. <laughs> but- I, I'm not going to cancel my Netflix now. All right. But, they're uh, going to keep you going on the Netflix for this, Joel. Yep. Yep, I mean they're gonna get my other seven dollars. I only got one account now. Lots of considerations here. Again, Any tangent. Well, we get a good tangent. Talk Netflix here. You, talk you, Netflix chart. I mean, there is a trade here. Look at what happened yesterday. So it wasn't a matter of yesterday being. And I, I'm correcting myself for what I said off the hop that it was kind of sell everything. It wasn't because Roku wasn't really down much yesterday. Shopify wasn't really down much yesterday. Netflix was actually up yesterday. So you kind of saw a little bit of rotation into the old leaders. So this market is all about rotation. It continues to rotate around and identifying that if you can get ahead of that rotation, you make a lot of money, you know, and obviously, you know, I've, I've done that a few times, you know, and sometimes right, sometimes wrong. But I mean, it's all about identifying that rotation. And we did have some rotation into the higher beta names yesterday. Um, you know, I don't think it was across the board. But at least it was on from those three stocks I just looked at. If there's other examples out there, let me know. I mean, Tesla was up too. Go for yep. w is, is saying. Um, so, you know, it wasn't just to sell everything. It was a sell. The stocks that had been rallying, like the Caterpillars that had come back a little bit. Or well, I guess Caterpillar is a bad example. But Deer is a great example. I mean, look at the Deer chart, Joel. And don't tell me technicals. So, you know, I've, I've been guilty of saying sometimes technicals don't work. Sometimes they do. And the absence of fundamentals, they do, they do work. And this year, what a, what a level. And you got back up there. And so here's a stock that sells off from 170 to the low 140s in a matter of two weeks at the beginning of August. Over the next month, rallies it all back, kisses the 170 yesterday, and rolls over again. Price has memory. That 170 is huge. I would be a seller of deer on rallies. Oh, and also, if you look at, I mean, not only uh, this month, last month, the high was 69.03, then 71.22, and then 69.99. So there, there's where your institutional uh, levels are on that one. So, wow, that is, I'd never know, Deer is really, is Cat held up that well or not? 
cats uh, now cats a little bit weaker but uh, let's talk um, we haven't even talked about brokerage wars here yet Dennis and this is well, this is game changer man the game changer in this industry it could be I mean um, it, it's gonna it's gonna be very interesting and obviously yeah it's a game changer for where they're gonna strike the revenues from we talked yesterday that they still get some significant revenue from payment for order flow. But here we are overnight, Ameritrade following suit here, Spencer. They've announced all zero commissions, it looks like, for all stock trades. Well, you give me the headline. Because yeah, they, they, announced this, they announced this after the close, I believe, yesterday. Is uh, Following the lead of Charles Schwab, they are eliminating commissions on ETFs, stocks, and options trades. So 695 is now $0 per trade. Um, clients trading options will pay 65 cents per contract with no exercise or assignment fees. So is that retroactive? Can that be right? Re- if that's yeah. retroactive, I'm going to be retiring tomorrow from TV okay. Ameritrade. <laughs> I will uh, tell you right now, we are getting, you know, don't tell me these imbalances don't work here either. We're starting to lift here on this market and TLT has rolled over. That's one consideration, I guess, because, um, you're starting to see the bank show a little bit of light. They were way down this morning when the TLT was higher. TLT has just went red. TLT goes red is usually good for this market. So there are some catalysts here this morning. I'm not coming to tell you to buy the dip here, but I'm telling you I would not be selling this fall right now because right now from what I see, and I'm talking very short-term trading, but I see buy imbalances across the board. I see the TLT suddenly just kiss the red and I see the S&Ps trying to show some life. If we continue to not start to roll or get some selling balances coming in here, I think you're going to see this S&P start to uh, come up here. And I've started to position myself a little bit long on the spy just uh down here right now i was hedged coming in but i'm starting to get a little bit long here as we talk on the spy just because i think it could lift up here with uh these imbalances yeah because they just want to pop these buy orders at a higher price they don't want to you know the buy sitting on the desk and they don't want to they don't want to fill them near the low of the day. They want to pop it up a little bit and then fill them and then take them down. So um, I'll just say, just going back to these brokerage, who knows how this is going to end. Uh, a, a TD Ameritrade here, I'm looking at monthly support at $33. I see two lows in the 33 handle back in October and November of 2016. So if you're looking for a target on downside there, 33.50. Currently, what are we traded? 33.15? Holy macro. We're already at that area. So there is this there is some monthly support in this area. After that, it looks like 31 and a half. Uh Schwab, who got this Just stop at the mirror trade for a second because sure. we look at here and I had multiple traders telling me yesterday when this thing's down 15% that isn't this overdone. And I was like, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, you think about, you know, and somebody on CBC, and I, I haven't analyzed the numbers, so no quote me on this or anything, but, you know, somebody was saying on CNBC yesterday that they get 40% of the revenue. You well, know, we're talking it, about a 40% cut in the revenue here. Not quite. Not quite. Do you have it, the numbers, Spencer? Well, they don't, I don't believe TD Ameritrade breaks out uh, revenue from commissions and or payment for it. Okay. So significant, significant yes. uh, fall in revenue is going to happen here. Right. But really, this is where analysts really can come in handy because they have models. And by showing yeah. by showing their, their model adjustments, that can really paint a picture for how big of, uh, of a drop this could mean. So KBW, for example, uh, their model for their for, for TD Ameritrade's fiscal year uh, earnings per share uh, based on this cut, this commission cut to zero uh, drops from three dollars ninety five cents for the uh, full year EPS. To three dollars and nine cents. So, so uh, three dollars and what? What is it? Three ninety five to three dollars and nine cents. Yeah, so significant, and that's, maybe that's still being. I sound that sounds optimistic to me. I, the reason I'm just saying, you know, is obviously it fell ten more percent after that when people were saying as a buy fifteen percent. People want to come in here and say, hey, you know, this is just because they're going to go right back up. They're going to find a way. I mean, this just you know this Schwab move. You know, obviously it's going to, you know, it's an attack on, you know, whoever they can, you know, obviously Meritrade and that too, but they responded immediately. So I don't think a lot of people are canceling their Meritrade accounts now and going to Schwab. Why would you? They just respond. And E-Trade going to have to probably follow suit as well, or everybody's going to go from E-Trade to Ameritrade. So I don't think there's a choice. I think they're all going to have to follow suit. So, you know, you're losing one big piece of the pie. I mean, yes, they get revenue from, you know, rebates and on the exchanges. Yes, they get revenue from payment for order flow from off-exchange market makers, which we talked about yesterday. 
but you know this commission 695 a trade this is significant revenue so i'm gonna wait until these stocks stop going down and i don't think they're ready to stop going down yet um and that's why it's down another dollar fifty you had some analysts uh, you had an analyst going from overweight to underweight who was that today spencer it was um oh, yeah, i was I just looking that. at a minute ago it was uh, Barclays. Barclays going Over from there. overweight to underweight on both Schwab and Ameritrade. So they were at a buy and they went down immediately to a sell. So just because of this, lowered their price targets on here. Here's the price target lower. Holy cow. Look at Ameritrade. They had a price target of 57 bucks on this. They lowered it to 31. That's crazy. Like they just cut their price target in half on this news. So, um, Barclays on uh, on Schwab lowered it from 48 to 34. Reason Schwab, because Schwab is a full brokerage side. You know, they have a lot of other revenue sources. This is not as big of a deal to Schwab as it is to Ameritrade and E-Trade. That's why people were asking, why is Schwab not down more? Because they were the ones that did it. Because Schwab has other sources of revenue, a lot they, of other sources. They have the advisory service. All have, kinds of other services. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So where Ameritrade and, and E-Trade are discount brokers, they're focused on the retail customer. So this is ground zero for them. That's why those two stocks got hit harder. They're both down here again this morning. I'd just say, in my opinion, I'd wait till it stops going down before I even think about getting down dirty in this because the dust has not even settled on this yet. Uh, some interesting uh, uh, comments in the in the chat. Uh, Lombardo 141 is worried about the free commissions. He thinks there's a catch and he's, he's worried about his executions getting slowed down. I, man, I don't think they could turn the clock back on the pipes. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. And then, um, you know, uh, David Jones is saying where my orders not be sold, you know, order flow is still a way to make money. So these firms are well, still- Well, it's going to be their, one of their only ways to make money. So your orders are going to get sold more. <laughs> yeah. I yep. mean, this is, you know, there's definitely going to be, I mean, if they ever attacked, it's if regulars ever attacked- pay- I mean, they have other, you know, they make money off of interest, right? That's that's not, we can't forget that. That's what they're, yeah, but that's what they're saying on CNBC, you know, and they gave this whole argument on oh, that's very last night. So it's, it's real, but uh, let's break it down here. They make a hell of a lot more, I would bet you, from payment for order flow than they do off interest when interest rates are 1%. You know, yes, the counts are huge, but I think, you know, there's a lot more money. I don't know. I haven't sat there and did the, but I would think they make a lot of money off of payment for order flow. I think they'll get, get back into prop, you know, maybe more prop trading, you know? Let's something. look up. Like, I mean, this is going to be, obviously. No, you know, the bank, like the, TD Ameritrade and well, I don't think the... they can do that either. You know, well, maybe, you know, they get their own desk going. I mean, that's a consideration. Do they want to start making markets? I mean, obviously, interactive brokers have done that for a long time, have their own market making unit. E Trade has their own market making unit too, which is a good point, Joel. So, you know, Who instead knows? of selling off this order flow, maybe they just got to start trading against it themselves. You've always so. talked about that. You've always talked about, you know, if they can internalize that. But man, well, man. and E Trade has. I mean, E Trade does do some of that. Um, so, you know, the, the, the dynamics of the brokerage world just changed overnight. There's going to be a lot of things that we don't even think about, you know, fallout from this. There's going to be a lot of fallout from this. But one thing that, you know, you can say, and I know there's, if there's any market structure people listen to us, they want to. And I've had some people tweet at me, does this bring payment for order flow back into, you know, now the argument is going to be so much stronger on that side to keep payment for order flow because it allowed brokerage commissions to go to zero. So I can't see them regulating off exchange trading at all now. This is a huge argument for them. This was always the argument that this keeps commissions low while it just drove commissions to zero. So I've always argued, you know, you've got to talk about the hidden costs of price improvement. You've got to talk about the spreads. And, you know, we'll have Joe Saluzzi on here sometime and he can explain it as well. He's, uh, he's at a market papers. structure conference. I tried to get him yeah, on. And yeah, I've written papers on this myself, you know, like I've written comment letters. I've obviously, you know, done a report, two reports through the CFA Institute on this, actually three reports. Um, so, you know, I don't know a lot about this stuff, too. It's going to be, you know, a lot of follow from this. But I will just tell you the argument for payment for order flow just got better for them. So the Citadels are probably smiling about this, to be honest with you, um, even the Virtue Financials, uh, because, you know, I can't see them going and regulating, um, you know, the off exchange market making and payment for order flow when they just drove commissions to zero. So that's where they're making the money on the other side. The brokerage is going to say, well, if you take that away from us too, 
we're going out of business. So you know, that would be the argument on the other side now. So you know I who has to really be scratching their head now. about this? You know who has to really be scratching their head about this? That? Bank of America. You know, buying what about the, the banks and they're, you know, you think about all your banks Merrill how Lynch. they're trading businesses as, as well, too. I mean, now you get commissions of zero. Um, do all their discount brokerages have to follow suit? I mean, I know in Canada, and I can speak from on behalf of Canadian banks, I mean, I think about this. And you've got, you know, six ninety five a trade or seven ninety five a trade all from the major banks. Do they all have to follow suit and lower commissions or and risk? You know, or do they because a lot of business might go to E-Trade and Ameritrade from them now? I mean, you know, they were competitive when they were four ninety five, five ninety five, six ninety five with E-Trade and Ameritrade. Now, do they have to follow suit, too? Because payment for order flow isn't even legal in Canada. So it's a whole different aspect in the, from the Canadian perspective. So market structure guys are going to have lots of interesting commentary coming yep. from here. I'm just thinking on the fly here. So, you know, obviously, you know, as I'm going, I'm just, you know, I'm put that much. You're coming up yet. with some great ideas. And you there's know what also? Of, there, there's going to be a fallout here. Like, do you want to go and sign up at, you know, Scotia Discount Brokerage if you're Canadian for $9.95 a trade right now? Or are you going to go to E-Trade for nothing? I mean, I think they're going to have to follow suit and lower commissions as well. There is, you know, this is actually good. You know, it is good for the retail customer. Again, if it starts to affect liquidity in the markets, they might pay for it, though. So that's the other consideration is, and we've talked about this on the show a lot, is that as you have more and more volume go off exchange, that in, it doesn't incentivize liquidity providers to provide much liquidity, at least on the lit market. And that could widen spreads. And that's why I've said it, I said it yesterday. That's why, you know, the small cap stock space is a mess. Large caps have high frequency volume and high frequency liquidity providers. The small caps don't have as much of that. They have some of the off exchange guys, but, you know, there's a lot of considerations here, a lot of fallout stuff we haven't even thought of yet. So it'd be I, interesting some to get a couple of market some, structure people on too. We, we will. We will next week. But, um, you know, just um, a point that was made in the YouTube chat, when, when all the dust settles here, everyone obviously, you know, is, ah, you know, the stocks are getting killed. You know, this could lead to some consolidation in the industry. Right. I mean, maybe, you know, well, we've already I, had that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, we've had some and we could, you're right. We could have even more, uh, but TD Ameritrade bought Scott trade what, two years ago. Oh man. So, I gotta be regretting that. But, um, all right. Well, there's we a, lot, a lot. There's gonna be a lot of follow from this. It's huge news. And that's why I cannot come in here comfortably and say, I'm going to buy Ameritrade because it's 33 bucks and it was 50 and it's going back to 50. I don't know where it's going. And what's it mean for the exchanges as well? Like, let's look at ICE and let's look, you know, if you're going to be focusing more on the payment for order flow side, because that mean more volume goes off exchange, that's not good for the exchanges. You know, they completely ignored those yesterday. ICE was not down yesterday. CBOE was not down yesterday. Um, NDAQ was not down yesterday. Do those stocks start to roll over? I think they might. I would not want to own any of these exchanges at all. Because this is not good, in my opinion, and obviously I haven't really sat down and, you know, thought hours on this or not, but just thinking on the fly here, that, you know, if you're going to be focused more on the payment for order flow side, and you're going to drive more volume off exchange if, you know, it's, it's most of it's already off exchange anyways, but it's definitely not good news for the exchanges here, I don't think. So uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'd I'm i be concerned owning the exchange. I would want not want to own ICE. I would not want to own N NDAQ. CME is its own animal because CME is still a monopoly with the S&P futures all trading, you know, in one place. Does that get broken eventually? Potentially. So I don't know if I want to own that either. <laughs> I don't want to own the brokers. I don't want to own the exchanges. Not, not right now. Not until I have more information and see what the fallout from this means. And uh, we'll follow it. We'll follow it in the charts here. So we, uh, we're really going off script today, but that's okay. Well, we don't have a script, so we're, we're <laughs> always off script. We have a script, way. Dennis. You just never look at it. I, I never even log into it. I'm bad like that. Never well, log into well, the script. Sorry, it, guys. It's okay, because it's 8.35. I completely wing it all. <laughs> it's okay. It, it's 8.35. That's why I get myself in trouble sometimes. I, I do want to bring on our guest today, a new guest for us, David Keller. He's the chief market strategist at StockCharts.com. David, good morning. Good morning. How are you guys? Doing okay. How about yourself? I'm doing great. Doing All right. I'm, 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 I'm going to run with this one, David, because we had okay. we had such a fun conversation. Uh, what was it, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago? Yeah, that's and, right. And uh, I just want to give you a little background on David here. Uh, forget his market background. Uh, he's not only is he an Ohio State fan, okay, yeah. he 
was in the Ohio State band. All right. And has anyone <laughs> ever seen Script Ohio? Do you know what Script Ohio is? Do you know what that is, Spencer? You should, or else you're fired. Yeah, that's where they spell out the the Ohio when they do the the the, the I, right? They, they dot, dot the, the I. They dot the the I, finest right? tradition in college sports, John. Right. I knew that. They got, it, it's a it's a tuba, right? A sousaphone, indeed. Yeah. Sousaphone of fun. Yeah. 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 And David, you have dotted the I on the O H. I mean, I can't even say the whole thing on uh, whatever <laughs> that that team down south. You've done there that. You go. You've done that in Michigan Stadium. That's correct. So full disclosure, I was at the bottom of the H and I mainly did that because that was the first place you, you got in your place first and then you could just relax and goof off while the rest of the band was figuring things out. But yes, I did it a number of times in Michigan Stadium and neither that was mid 90s and neither of those were especially good sports experiences for me, but pretty cool place to visit for sure. Yeah, yeah. We haven't had much good since then. But uh, <laughs> anyways, we're not going to talk about Michigan football right now or Ohio Fair State enough. football. We're going to we're going to talk about your platform, uh, StockCharts.com. And yeah. uh, I have we have one buddy, a uh, friend of the show, Sean Udall, um, mm. loves the platform and yeah. uh, and and uses his lot, puts out some uh, pretty charts on it. So uh, just tell, I mean, you recently made the move over there. Tell mm -hmm. us why you made the move and uh, tell us some uh, good things about stockcharts.com. Yeah. Thanks so much guys. Um, yeah. So, so I joined just recently as chief market strategist. So I actually moved from Northeast Ohio, from Cleveland, Ohio, out to Seattle to join these guys. And, uh, and so far it's actually been really, really cool. I mean, stock charts is a, is a, uh, it's a website that's been around for about 20 years now. And uh, a lot of people have been using it for a long period of time, but we're sort of looking to reinvent it and, and grow into the next phase for, um, for stock charts. And so that involves a lot of upgrades to the charting platform. Um, Dennis, I think the quote was, I'm going to wait until those stocks stop going down. And so we want to give people a, a way to visually see and not confuse the bottom of the screen with support, which I think a lot of people unfortunately do. So we'll hopefully That's give them point. some great tools to visualize how things are evolving, especially now. I mean, when, when, when things get volatile and things get crazy, that's when I would argue you need the most, you have the most need for looking at, at visualization. So, uh, so yeah, we'll keep working on things for sure. You're, you're not supposed to buy the bottom of the page and sell the top of the page. We always joke, never confuse the bottom of the page with support. People get that's so, so excited true. that it gets down there and it's like, it's down there for a reason, you know? That, that's so true though. Like you look at this yeah. Ameritrade chart and people yes. look at that and say, Hey, look how, you know, that's got to go back up. I mean, people naturally <laughs> want to buy something on sale. I like, I get Always. that. It just, it's human nature. I mean, I go yes. and the first thing I look at when I go into the grocery store is the sale items. People want to <laughs> buy stuff on sale. It works that's well true. at the grocery store. It doesn't work that well in the stock market though. Not so much. And, I, and there's a reason why there's the whole idea of the momentum factor, right? Which is broadly speaking, depending on your time frame, you over, over time usually want to bet on what's working and not bet on what's not working. And, and over multiple cycles, longer period of time, that tends to work. In the short term, you have more of a mean reversion trade. And so if you're thinking more swing trading type of environment, absolutely buy weakness and sell strength. And that's how you'll bet on that. But over the long term, you're really better off betting with the trends. And so a lot of times we're trying to help people understand through, you know, proprietary ranking systems and things like that. You know, you want to overall lean on what's working. And, and, you know, to your point, Dennis, banks, financials, the XLF, like it's not working right now by any technical measure, I could I could argue. All right, let's uh, we got a really good question here uh, coming from mm. Dr. Che. And um, so how stockcharts.com, how is it different or better than TradingView? Hmm. It's a really good question. Something we're debating many, 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 many days internally here. Um, you know, so for us, we think of, of technical analysis, we think of market analysis in three pillars. So pillar number one is information in the form of charts for us. Second pillar is education. And the third picture pil uh, pillar is commentary. So the idea is we want someone to come into stock charts and have the information they need to make good decisions, um, but also have education to help use the tools better. And then commentary. So experts from people like me and others that have been doing this for years and years to sort of share our lesson learned and, and help you understand how to use the tools a little better. And we feel like those three things are what we can what we can provide the most people are unable to do. And we've got a really good team of commentators. We've got uh, pretty good capabilities with education. We also have Stock Charts TV, which I don't know if a lot of people uh, on, on the show are familiar with, but 
Uh, we have a live streaming channel that Joel hopefully will have you on there very, very soon uh, to share some of your thoughts. But, uh, but we actually broadcast real time commentary, but also a lot of education about how to use technical analysis, how to think of things visually. Um, so yeah, hopefully those three things uh, make stock charts a pretty compelling choice for people. And uh, getting to your own methods of technical mm. analysis, um, you know, there's a lot of indicators out there, analysis, paralysis. Uh, Dennis and I have always kept a very kind of elementary, you know, high, low, close, double top, triple top, double bottom, triple bottom, multiple closes in the same area. I could probably I go a little bit fancier with uh, some pivot points and some retracements. Uh, yeah. What, what, like, what's your go to? I mean, are you, uh, I mean, obviously people are candlesticks. What, what are your favorite methods of uh, technical analysis? So there, there's a lot out there. And I, I always caution people, probably similar to what you're saying. I, I always try to remind people to keep it simple. And as a quick story, I was early in my career. I was with Bloomberg actually originally in New York. I've heard And my that. job, yeah, so my job was to go around the trading floors in New York and to meet with uh, FX traders, uh, bond traders, equity traders, and help them use Bloomberg better and, and really in the form of charting and technical analysis. And so I'm walking down this string of uh, FX traders and I see this one guy and I think he probably had a hundred different technical indicators on his screen at once. He has like the four panels covered with lines and I'm just looking at this, I'm watching him for a couple of minutes. And I'm like, this guy's incredible. Like, this is unbelievable. So I tap him on the shoulder and I'm like, excuse me, like I'm a technical analyst. Like, how are you doing this? This is unbelievable. And he said, I have absolutely no idea what any of this stuff means. <laughs> said, but the head of the desk will walk by and look over my shoulder and go, look at that guy. He's all over the market. That's great. <laughs> and so the lesson is, if you want to complicate things and impress people visually, give them the eye candy of what you're doing, you can add a lot of tools on, on the charts that you're using. But I have never seen someone consistently do well with a lot of stuff on a chart, because what happens is it causes you to make decisions that you probably shouldn't, right? It, it gives you a reason. It supports things like confirmation bias and all behavioral uh, you know, things that get in the way of good decisions. So I've always argued to keep it simple and keep it to things that make sense that you could easily explain to someone. So for me, it's things like I, I actually go back and forth between bars and candle charts because on a lot of the actually markets yesterday, you had a lot of engulfing patterns based on just the quick reversal that you saw. So on, you know, the XLF is probably a good example, but the broad market on bonds, the TLT, a lot of those had engulfing patterns. And so candlesticks sort of jump out, out of the screen there. Other than that, it's moving averages, it's RSI. If I'm going to use one indicator, that's probably it. And for the most time, 90% of the time, that's sort of the toolkit that I would pay attention to. And right. then for me, the other, other thing I would say is, is with time frame. So I think a lot of people get stuck in one time frame, like looking at a one day chart or something. And I would encourage people to explore different time frames so you understand the trend from multiple levels. Wait, David, I, I just want to come in for a second. I just want to understand yeah. what you're saying. You're saying yeah. I don't need seven screens. <laughs> you, if you want to have seven screens by all means i empower you to do so but i would encourage that six of those screens be covered with something other than charts for sure. <laughs> i only have six i only have six screens now david so <laughs> okay there you go i'm down there to six i got rid of a screen and i'm gonna get rid of another one just on your advice we'll get it down there you go there you go <laughs> right because that's what i mean i think behaviorally right a lot of times if you if you're familiar with confirmation bias like you develop an opinion and then you look for something to validate that opinion very, very simplistically. And the problem, if you have too much in front of you, a lot of times it's very easy for you mentally to find a reason to pull the trigger on something. And you want the charts to tell you something, right? You want to, you want to come with, without a preconception and just let the charts give you the, the information, give you the data, focus on the evidence. And if you're able to do that with a lot of screens in front of you, do it. Um, but I found a lot of people it ends up getting in the way of, of a, of a good, clear decision-making pattern. Uh, just over your years, you've been to markets, yeah. you've been on, you know, trading gas. I don't know. Have you been on any trading floors per se, any exchanges or, or not in your career? You know, so I've never worked on one, but yeah, my role at Bloomberg actually would go to all the Chicago exchanges. We actually covered North and South America. So I would go to buy side, sell side shops, sort of all around that region and, uh, and sort of see how they were doing things. Yeah. Take it away from the floor. I mean, you've seen a lot of different traders slash investors. Can you can you just uh, give us, you know, one or two things, you know, you think that, uh, you know, either uh, mistakes new people make or, mm. you know, just uh, just a couple of things at the t top of your list. Absolutely. And so I'll give you a couple. I'll give you one right off. I think that the most important mistake or, or thing that I think people could address, especially early on, is developing a good routine. 
um, especially you know for the course of the day, right? So the first thing you need to do is decide how you're trying to win this game or what your approach is going to be, how you're how you're actually going to address the markets. But then once you figure that out, it's developing a good routine that you can follow consistently. And what I find with a lot of sort of novice traders, novice investors, they're sort of all over the place. They're hearing ideas from different places. They're hearing it in a chat room. They're hearing it on TV. Uh, and then they just kind of run with it as opposed to using those things as inputs to maybe validate your own work, right? You have to do your own work. You have to have your own process. So, you know, I, and I've met with guys like Steve Cohen and portfolio managers at Fidelity during my time there. And these are guys that have been winning for decades and have a really good approach for things. And what strikes me with all of those people is their routines, right? They have a specific way they do things. They have a way they look at the markets. They have a way that they're alerted when something is, is worth paying attention to. They have rules in place that they follow pretty closely. And it's not kind of a hit or miss type of thing. So I would encourage everyone to really think about your routine. Think about how you go through the day and, and how you um, sort of follow how you gather information and make sure that that's consistent. Because doing that consistently over multiple days, multiple weeks, that's when you really start to, I think, develop some some pretty good patterns. All um, right. I, yeah. I did. I, I don't know if I'm uh, kind of sideswiping you here um, about the platform. I don't know if you have mm -hmm. uh, a, sh a screen you could share or if yeah. you don't have that, we'll definitely get you back on next time. But uh, yeah. just, you know, simply, do, can you do you have a can you share a screen or? Yep. Yep, okay. Yep, give me a second um, here. We'll just um, let's stock. Let's uh, let's get a stock uh, from the chat here. Uh, let's see. The first stock that pops in from either of the chats is what we're going to have you analyze here. Sure. And no one is popping in yet. Oh, Dr. J is throwing you a curveball here. Uh, SFIX. Okay. Well, you can already see uh, sort of my go-to chart here. I mean, this is sort of if, you know, knowing nothing else, this is the chart that I would bring up first, which is essentially a daily chart going back for the last year, just looking at daily price bars, the 50 and 200 day moving averages, RSI, as I mentioned here at the bottom, and then, and then at the very bottom is actually the relative performance of SFIX versus the S&P 500. Um, so, you know, the way that I would look at this, so, uh, you know, number one, it starts with price. And the way I always think of charts is you start at the current bar, what I'd call the final bar, and you look left from there. So where are we at relative to any key levels we want to pay attention to? And the first thing that strikes me about this is you have the price here and it's below two downward sloping moving averages. So despite what you want to think about the chart, the stock is going down by that definition, right? The fact that the moving averages are rolling over, prices at the bottom, it is undeniably going down. And the reason why I can say that is because of that. Also because we've just had lower highs and lower lows. And the most recent move was a lower low, right at support though, which is what's really compelling about this. But overall, the trend, the trend has been down. Yeah, what's I got to interrupt you because this is, okay. it's down three bucks in the pre-market. Yeah. <laughs> it had earnings. So I, yeah. I don't and 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 listen. I'm I'm cool with not knowing that, and I found knowing that is good. But doing the analysis without knowing that it is. is perfect, right? You should be doing that without without paying yep. attention good. to to the earnings. So I'm glad I didn't say it's a it's a screaming buy here at eighteen. Right. That's good. You, you would have got that. You would have got the uh, the the buzzer from our <laughs> oh, hot, from our hot yeah. potato segment. Yeah. Um, yeah. How about a different one here? Not sure, moving yeah. as much in the pre market. The house of mouse. How about Disney? Sure. So you're right. So, you know, with a lot of stocks, I, you find a similar type of pattern right now. And I would say, you know, we didn't talk about like a broad market outlook, but I, you know, for me, I'm, I'm definitely cautious. And the reason is because forget about looking at the broad S and P chart. If you look at a ton of individual stocks, which is what I do all the time, every weekend, I look through the whole S and P. And wow. if you do that, it's hard to be super excited about stocks. You won't be climactically negative because there's not a lot of really ugly charts, but there's just not a lot of great charts, right? So KLAC, right? That's the type of thing that just keeps going up and to the right. But that is one among, for every one of those, there's a hundred that look a lot worse. And Disney, unfortunately for me, sort of fits in that bucket of things that just don't look good anymore. And I'll, I'll show you why. Number one, this is the lower high that we had earlier in the month. And a lot of stocks sort of did that. The broad S&P did that as well. We sort of established a lower high. You, you, you went to a higher high in August and then we're unable to, to match that. And so that at the very beginning is a starting point to maybe an unwinding. And then breaking down through this neckline here around 129, 130, 
uh, is really sort of the, the final straw. Yesterday, we sort of traded down through that. Anytime that happens, I'd be looking for the follow through today to see what sort of, uh, you know, if we get a follow through to that breakdown. But overall, it's definitely rotated, in my opinion, from a period of accumulation to a period of distribution. What's interesting about the RSI, that's why I think it's so important to watch something like this, is in a bull market phase, right, when a stock's going up, the RSI tends to be up in this range from about 40 up to about 80 or so. In a bear market range, it tends to be down here, never really gets above 60, which is why this was really important here at the beginning of the month. And you never usually get below 40. So as this continues lower, in my opinion, that confirms the fact that we've sort of rotated down and it's more, more bearish than, than bullish leaning. And just the fact that for the last two months, you haven't been paid to own Disney. There are a lot of other places, home builders come to mind, right? Stocks that are, have been more breaking out, more constructive than something like Disney. So overall, I, I would be leaning more negative than positive. All right, David Keller is the chief market strategist at StockCharts.com. Also, his blog, MarketMisbehavior.com, explores the intersection between behavioral psychology and the markets. David, thank you so much for the time today. Go Blue. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Go all Bucks, right. Joel. Take Oh, all right. <laughs> I like that guy. That was a great interview. Uh, we are definitely going to get him back on again. And uh, no, I like it. With Triple D, you getting in any trouble over there? Or are you doing okay? Well, my S&P long is not doing that well. We're down about two and a half points. So <laughs> hoping that hey, these imbalances just don't, don't all over to negative. They're don't still hope. highs. So maybe don't. I'm getting suckered in. Maybe I'm getting suckered by looking. I mean, Square's got 115000 to buy right now. So, and then stock's trading down 0.8%. So like I said, one of two things going to happen. It's going to be a huge, some huge sellers that come in, which very well might happen in the next 40 minutes. The s going to start to go up. So as of right now, you're just looking. There isn't much of an arb just in the pre-market because the stocks are down and that's down. I'm just looking at this information and trying to derive and say, hey, maybe some of these stocks that are down as far as they are aren't going to open down this far. So we shall see. So far, the trade not working so well. So far, our TSG is leaking here too, Joel. I know. What's going on with that, man? Well, because it's trading. The, 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 the bloody stock in London's probably trading or starting <laughs> to give some back, which is what they do for the acquirers. So. We know oh, it's man. just trading off of that now, so the risk arbs will be all Come over on, it. can't even let us get out. We'll get yeah, I don't even let us get out. We're, we're only get the loss of 22. Now we're looking at a 20 and a half. So. Let's buy more. Go yeah, for the no, takeout price. You. No, thank you. No, I know. I know. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> other news. Right. Yeah, go. Spencer's yeah. got some ideas. Uh, well, I just want to get to the stitch fix numbers here because the volatility. Oh, yeah, we didn't do earnings. Course. No, we didn't, we didn't do us. anything, Dennis. What, what you did is talk about market structure. I bored everybody. They all turned <laughs> off the show. We probably have the fewest listeners we've ever had. All right. Uh, the Q4 EPS. Actually, this is pretty much a good uh, report all around with the exception of one number. So the Q4 EPS, $0.07 cents versus $0.04 cents sales was just about in line. They missed it by a hair, but essentially in line at $432 million. Uh, I saw that their new users were up 18% year over year. On the conference call, they gave some guidance, and that is where it ran into some problems. So the Q1 sales guidance that they gave, they gave a range of 438 to 442 million, and the estimate was at 451. So light on the Q1 sales guidance and uh, EPS guidance was uh, in line. So I, I don't know if it was actually a case of the sales guidance being weak or if the estimates were out of whack and one analyst was out to lunch and had his estimates too high. But regardless, that that's that headline right there during the conference call is the catalyst for this stock moving downward. This you got to see the after hours chart of this one, Joel. Yep. Go check this out, because if you want volatility in SFIX, <laughs> you got it. They smacked it on the initial report. They smacked it all the way down. That candle, Joel, and I and maybe I got it. grab I that got initial it. low. How low did they smack it on the initial report? 17. They smacked it down to 17, and then they rallied at over 21. Holy news, algos. They're nuts. They're nuts. They know nothing. <laughs> Taking that from Kramer. <laughs> it applies there, though, Jim. They know nothing, these algos. The news algos were all wrong everywhere on this. Smacked it down to 17, rallied up to 21. And then it just starts to leak and leak and leak, and it's all the way back down to 17. So the stock falls 15%, if I'm doing my math right. Am I doing that right? Three on 20? I think so. And then it rallies from 17 to 21. It rallies like 20% in the next, like, five minutes. And then it sells the 20% back off. What's up? <laughs> What's up? Is I, who needs uh, a site 
Wait, don't they like like help you buy your clothes or something like that, Spencer? Is that the no, site? They, no, it's yes. a stitch. They stitch your yes. clothes up yes. for you. That you, you, you're no, no, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> It's not what it is. It's Joel's right. It's like a subscription service for your wardrobe. That's what it is. Yeah, then they, uh, subs- oh, they fix your wardrobe. They stitch it. It's stitch fix. They fix it's stitches. A, yeah, you know, you're talking to probably the two guys on Wall Street that spend the least amount of time on their wardrobes. So uh, I'm wearing like, a bright trading shirt from like 20 years ago. <laughs> I'm wearing a shirt when I got when I went to Hawaii. When I travel, I get shirts. Like I went to Hawaii. The shirts from Hawaii. So whenever I go somewhere, like I get a new You're shirt. You're so colorful, Joel. Yeah, yeah. So no, I just like I don't see any use for the company. You know, I mean, I don't see any use. Of- Wait, okay, can I take we're that striking back. that from the record. Yeah, but- yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've never traded it in my, you know, I did try to trade this once. I did try to trade it on the long side after bad earnings and I got smoked in it. So uh, I'm not, I mean, I hardly know anything about the company fundamentally, but I will tell you this chart looks awful. So I think you've got so many people underwater in this. Once again, any type of rally is probably going to be sold. You know, we've seen these stocks dip and then just continue to leak. I think this is going to be another case where people buying this at 17, 15, think they're going on sale, are going to look at this in a month and it's going to be at 15. And they're going to look at it in two months, it's going to be at 13. So that's my opinion. Um, again, what's going on with nothing Netflix? fundamental about the company. I'm, I'm looking. What's I, going I, on with Netflix? I don't know. I've been looking for the past minute or so and I don't, I, I have not. Deploy. I'm I not told you. I thought I told you. No, you were bullish. You were bullish. Was I bullish now? I've you said 200 on this Netflix. show. You I said, have said 200 you, on this you, show, long term Netflix. All I said, said was it was interesting that it had a good day yesterday. I said Roku, I gave the argument for the for okay, in, okay. Roku was the one I gave the argument that 98 had support. Not saying I'm not long either of these stocks. <laughs> and I'm I'm Netflix. I have argued on this show. So you could definitely yeah. not say I've been bullish Netflix. I have been bearish Netflix since 320. And I've said, I think it's under 200 bucks in one year. I have 10 months to get there. I'm halfway there in two months. I and think it's going under 200 bucks. What's the news? Gotta be some good. I don't money. know. I don't know. Come on, Spencer. News. I, um, Brentster. Uh, yell at Brentster. He's sitting there Brent, Brent, the desk. I, 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 Brentster's I, trying to do a live radio show. Here, I, already, so I already yelled down there and they're looking as well. So gotta I, be something I, interesting. I don't know. Um, uh, I will say, I will say that uh, uh, one of Triple D, I, this was kind of a combo call on uh, the Beyond Meat, uh, Beyond Skeptical. We are getting perilously close to filling that gap, you know, from the McDonald's PLT. My two long term calls are Beyond Meat under 100 and Netflix under 200. That's my two long term calls that I made over a month ago. And, and Tesla. No. No, I never. I don't have an opinion on Tesla because oh, yeah. I think Tesla's not going to zero. Oh. Uh, that's my only thing on Tesla. Hey, Step I out. drove the Tesla. I didn't just get to ride in the Tesla. I drove the Tesla uh, two days ago. You just got, sit there. And got do to nothing? drive my first Tesla. Tried the autopilot out and everything. Pretty cool. It's cool. I right? was in the Model Three Performance. This goes zero to sixty in three point two seconds. It's almost as fast as the Corvette. Crazy. I've never felt like speed like that. He's like, hit it. I punched it and it just like a rocket ship. You go back and you see it. It's crazy too because it's electric. So you don't like hear the motor rev up or nothing. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah, you Model out? 3 performance. Were you out on uh, the 401? No, we we're on back roads. We should be watching that. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't have an acceleration limit. They just have a speed limit. So anyways, cool car. Um you know, a lot of things, you know, very interesting. It's so weird. You know, the braking system, too. They have. Oh, like this- I know. The the automatic braking is so weird. weird. You like hit the gas all the way to the stoplight and then yeah. it just like stops you. It's so weird. I mean, you can uh, turn that off. That's a feature he said he could turn off. But I'm driving. I was like, I'm letting off the gas. The gas is approaching the stoplight. He's like, oh, yeah, you, you don't do that. You keep on the gas, Ray Tell, you're almost at the stoplight. Well, I, it's not I, gas, I guess. You keep on the electricity because <laughs> there is no gas in it. You know what? I got a accelerator. car. I had to take in my uh, my sweet uh, Chrysler S300 uh, potential engine problems, but I have the warranty. So they gave me this Durango. This is like I'm just like I'm driving a truck around and I go to the intersection and I take my foot off, you know, and I put it on the brake and the car shuts off. 
it has auto shut off at, at stoplights. And then when you, you know, when you stop and then my when truck you has that too. Oh, really? Yeah. My F-150 like... has that. I got the EcoBoost, which my buddy told me not to get because there's a lot of things that could break on it. But I did anyways. I bought the EcoBoost <laughs> and it shuts off. At the, it's kind of annoying. It shuts right off. At every, every time you stop the car for like more than two seconds, it shuts the car off. Yeah. And then it just kicks it back on. So I don't know. I'm probably going to need a new starter after like 20,000 <laughs> clicks. But it's starting and stopping it so much. You can turn that feature off too if you don't like it. It's like it's a little I've been trying to but... figure that out. I've been yeah. trying to figure that out. Well, the Tesla right. was that, I, I did not know it was going to be that fast. I never felt it felt like it was in a rocket ship. Like my face went like this. It didn't do probably any good for my shoulder injury there. But I mean, it's cool cars. Jason Rasnick, cool cars. This was the performance. Our Model 3 performance is what this one was. Okay. All right. Uh, do we need Spencer to run a little bit over here? Is there anything else you feel we want to cover or should we just wrap things up? There were no, I mean, did you want to talk about the, the new GoPro camera? We, we didn't get to rate My it. SPY along now is down, down 40 cents. So it's not working well at all. I'm assuming all these buy and balances are going to sell sometime real soon. <laughs> yeah, there aren't that many notable ratings this morning. Activism Blizzard are getting a downgrade to underperform at Burn. Just give me more bad news. Why don't you? Okay. Um, That's in my long-term portfolio. Back to even. Monster beverage down at Guggenheim. It's long-term investing is hard. Yeah, yeah, it is. I'm still not seeing any Netflix news. I'm sorry. I don't know what it is, but it's getting cracked here in the pre-market. 857. I'm going hunting. Going hunting. All right. So we'll we'll stay on for one more. Uh, GoPro here. Uh, They love this news. It's up 12 cents at 540. I don't know anything about the uh, about the camera. Let's see. Uh, not I don't even take... see the news here either. What is that? I, I, I don't know if there is news. That's that's what I'm starting. They to just think. don't like it. Um. Anyways, let's see. I mean, see if Grok Pro can even get to yesterday's high at five seventy nine, and then Amberella trades with that. Amber, ooh, bad day yesterday. No, it doesn't. Am Amber doesn't trade with GoPro at all anymore. That relationship anymore. broke years ooh. ago. Now, Ghost GoPro has obviously went from ninety to five. Amber's got other businesses. So I would say no. I would say GoPro does not trade with Amba at all anymore. Or yeah. Amba doesn't trade with GoPro. Amba's a better company. Okay. All right. That, that was a fun show. And uh, big shout out to David. Uh, that, he was a great guest. I'm definitely going to get him back on again soon. And Spencer, you did a great job as usual putting up with us. So why don't you wrap mm-hmm. things up and preview well, tomorrow's show? Yeah. On tomorrow's show, we'll be joined by Mark Chaikin. Also potentially just Lucy. Wait and see on that. Uh, if you missed any part of today's show or you want to hear it again or any of our archives, catch our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or TuneIn, or just rewatch our show on Benzinga's YouTube channel. Th- thanks again to our guest, Dave Keller. Thanks to all of you in our chats, both on YouTube and premarket.benzinga.com. Please remember all the information from our show is meant to be used as informational purposes only and not for investing or trading advice. Any questions, comments, concerns, email us, premarket at Benzinga. Dot com. That's it for us. Everyone have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you on Thursday.